Um, greetings, beautiful and blessed loved ones. Paisley Parvati Devi here with our weekly yoga philosophy share. If you're just joining us for the first time, welcome. Every Tuesday, I share a new video on Facebook and YouTube all about yoga philosophy. And yes, these videos are a great jumping off point if you're completely new to yoga philosophy. They're on a topic called the Yamas and Niyamas, which are a set of guidelines that are really foundational to all yogic thought. And of course, if you already have a little bit of background or experience with yoga philosophy, then let these videos just be an aid um, to your personal study and practice and I hope that these um, can help you deepen that a little bit and revisit some of these really foundational concepts in a deeper way. So I do share from this book every week, The Yamas and Niyamas, Exploring Yoga's Ethical Practice by Deborah Adele. Previous videos in this series are all posted in playlists on Facebook and YouTube. I'll link the YouTube playlist in the description box for you. And if you want to follow along with me, I invite you to like the page on Facebook, subscribe to me here on YouTube, um, and hit that bell so that you can get notifications for future videos and join me as we move forward and finish out the book together. So today we are on chapter eight. We're getting close to the end, you guys. I'm excited. Chapter eight is tapas, which translates into austerity. It is the third of the niyamas or actions, behaviors to be cultivated in order to attain inner peace. So you may be wondering, well, I don't even know what the yamas and niyamas are. What does that even mean? Those words sound weird. <laughs> I totally get it. I recommend going back to the beginning of this series. I do an introduction to the book and to the yamas and niyamas that goes into a little bit more detail on what they actually are. In a nutshell though, the yamas are actions or behaviors that can be restrained in order to cultivate inner peace. They relate mostly to our relationship to the outside world um, and our relationship with out, uh, other people, things outside of ourselves. And then the niyamas are the actions or behaviors that can be cultivated in order to attain inner peace and they have a little bit more to do with our own internal experience. So again, we are in the section on the niyamas, the more internal um, concepts. And that's not to say that any of these concepts can't be both internal and external. In fact, they all are. But that's just to give you a little bit more context on um, the distinction between the two, because it is said that um, it's advised to first work on the um, yamas, the actions to be restrained. And then once you've worked on that a little bit and have an understanding of that, you can go into the niyamas and start to cultivate. And in fact, it's easier to cultivate the behaviors to attain inner peace once you've already worked on restraining those behaviors that have not been helpful to you, right? You can't start a new project until you've completed the old one. You can't, um, you know, go on a new endeavor or plan a trip somewhere when you don't even know where you are right now, <laughs> when you're not grounded down where you already are, right? So it's um, cleaning, setting the table, cleaning the table, cleaning the space, making the space for the beautiful food and nourishment, uh, the beautiful finery and silverware to be placed onto the table. Okay, so today, again, we are starting the chapter on tapas, which translates from Sanskrit into English as austerity or self-discipline. It literally translates into burning, burning away our um, uh, things that don't serve us, burning away our bad habits, you know, our impurities, um, any ideas or concepts, um, behaviors, and so on that, that doesn't serve us. And so tapas can be really brought into some of the other yamas and niyamas as well because, um, for example, learning to be truthful, that can be a discipline, right? Learning to be um, uh, living life in moderation, brahmacharya, non-excess, not doing too much of something or too little of something. That's a discipline, right? That's tapas, austerity. So really, it's wonderful once we go through all of these together, um, we can learn and understand how each of them really interacts with each other and that they work together as a whole system. My husband talks about growing up on a large acreage outside of town. 
periodically to care for this land, his father would do a controlled burn. My husband watched as his father diligently prepared by checking the wind speed, wind direction, and the weather forecast for any unwanted or unforeseen surprises. And then my husband watched in disbelief as his dad lit a match to the field and everything went up in flames. As a small child, none of this made sense to him, especially as he gazed at the stark after effects of the burn. Everything looked charred and ruined, but within a few weeks, tiny green growth would sprout through the seemingly dead land, bringing new life and beauty, a kind of new beginning. My husband began to understand that the land had to be burned of its debris in order to produce its luscious bounty once again. So clearing the land in order to bring in the new, making the space burning away the impurities to bring in something that is luscious, new, full, full of life. Tapas literally means heat and can be translated as catharsis, austerities, self-discipline, spiritual effort, change, tolerance, or transformation. Tapas has the sense of cooking ourselves in the fire of discipline to transform ourselves into something else. It is our determined effort to become someone of character and strength. Much like cooking, cooking an egg denatures the egg, changing it into a different structure, tapas eventually changes our nature, turning us into a cauldron that can withstand any of life's challenges. Tapas is the day-to-day -day choice to burn non-supportive habits of the body and mind, choosing to forsake momentary pleasures for future rewards. In India, some spiritual renunciants practice extreme austerities. In the dead of winter, they sit for three hours in the cold, dressed only in a loincloth. They rig a container so that it will drip cold water on their heads and run down their almost naked bodies for the entire three hours. They do this practice for 45 days in a row. And then in the heat of summer, they build five small fires around themselves and one in a container on their head. They sit for three hours in the blazing heat. They build these fires daily and sit for three hours for 45 days. This is done to establish themselves in a firm, unmovable center that is not rocked or disturbed by any extremes in the external world they bring. They practice saying, staying still no matter what their thoughts or fears are running through their minds. Our practice does not need to be this daunting. However, the example of these spiritual ascetics might inspire us to a little more depth in our discipline. And much like a controlled burn, we need to pay attention to what is possible, what is safe, and what is timely for us in our current life context. When we have tested the wind, we can light the match, willingly burning away our laziness and our selfish desires. Whether we practice tapas by showing up at our mat for a regular po posture practice, the yoga asanas, which is what most of us in the West are familiar with, when you go to a yoga class, you're doing the posture practice. So whether we practice tapas by showing up on our mat for a yoga class or through constant acts of selfless service, we offer ourselves to the next higher version of us. where We willingly stand the heat so that we might produce luscious bounty with our lives. This guideline not only speaks to our personal effort, but also to those cathartic times of almost hopeless desperation when we find ourselves in the pain of unexpected loss or debilitating sickness, or in the throes of a life that seems like it has been turned upside down. It is almost as if God has checked the winds and started the fire, and we ourselves are the field that is being burned. And, like my husband who watched his father burn a field, none of it makes sense to us at the time. So on that note, let's take a moment. I just invite you to close the eyes, if that's safe. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, you can stand or sit. Just take a moment, take a few deep breaths here. And just come into the present, just letting this sink in. I invite you to continue to listen to this transmission with an open mind as much as possible. <clears throat> this idea of tapas or discipline can be rather off-putting. 
especially when the first example given is of, of an, a very extreme discipline uh, of sitting out in freezing cold water with uh, freezing cold weather with cold water dripping down or in blazing heat with fires all around. These are, as the author describes, very extreme austerities carried out by ascetics. However, we don't need to go to these extremes in order to attain real benefits. So just keeping the eyes closed, take a few more deep breaths here, just pausing for a moment. This in itself can be tapas austerity. Simply sitting, keeping the eyes closed. It takes discipline, right? It takes practice to just sit and keep the eyes closed. Because the external world is a constant distraction. The external world, the sensory world, is always fighting for our attention. And so even just sitting with ourselves for five, maybe ten minutes at a time, can be this discipline. It is challenging. And that's okay. We sit with the discomfort, we sit with the challenge. We allow it to be as it is. We accept the challenge. We accept the discomfort. This is the burning away. Or maybe it feels great, you know, it doesn't have to be uncomfortable to be an austerity. There's this further idea that all austerity or all discipline is uncomfortable, like it's forcing something forcing ourselves to do something we don't really want to do. And in fact, when tapas is continued, yeah, maybe sometimes it is really hard. Maybe most of the time it's really hard, but maybe sometimes it's easy too, because we know we can see how it benefits us. So just allowing that to be what it is. And if you do have a meditation practice, I'm sure you can see what I'm saying. And if you don't have a meditation practice, just know that, well, of course, like I said, it can be difficult at times and we have to have that discipline to kick ourselves and, and take that five minutes or whatever it is that we need to do. It becomes easier after a time because we can see how that discipline has helped us and how it actually does help us feel better in the long term in the long run. Allowing that to be what it is and trusting that maybe not all of this transmission makes sense today, but if not, we're planting a seed. So I invite you to listen with as open a heart and as open a mind as you can and trust that the seed will be planted and maybe some of it comes through today, whatever needs to be understood today will be and everything else will come as the seed gets watered, when the conditions are ripe for the seed to sprout. The rest will come. So sometimes this discipline does not make sense at the time. And yet it is these times that shape and mold us into someone of depth. Our debris gets burned away and we are left more humbled and strengthened by the mystery of what is beyond our grasp of control or of understanding. It is these darkest times of pain, loss, and confusion that weave something profound in us. Spiritual teacher Ram Das speaks eloquently to this jewel of tapas. When he experienced a debilitating stroke, something he never expected to happen to him, he found a new opportunity for himself and for others as he began to wrestle with the possibilities and effects of aging. He chose to speak of his experience as being stroked by God, rather than as having had a stroke. And he termed the phrase fierce grace to speak of his experience of being burned by the fire of divine love. There is a bumper sticker which states, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We can chuckle all we want, but there is a great truth to this statement. Tapas can take us to the place where all of our resources are used up, where there is nothing left but weakness, 
where all of our so-called props have been taken away. It is in this barren place where we have exhausted all that we have and all that we are, that new strength is shaped and character is born if we choose to fearlessly open ourselves to the experience. It is perhaps, perhaps the greatest gift life could offer us. Charlene Westerman speaks truthfully to the danger and the possibility of catharsis when she states that during these times we have two choices, to break down or to break open. We can't prevent these times of catharsis in our lives or know their shape or outcome, but we can prepare ourselves for them through our daily practice, through building our ability to stay in unpleasantness, and through the small daily choices that we make. Top us as daily practice. When I lived near the shores of Lake Sacagawea, I had the grace of time to take long walks on miles of land that held the promise of seeing no one. One day, I stumbled upon a large nesting site for blue herons along the banks of the lake. I became a constant visitor until the herons accepted me as part of what belonged. I watched as eggs were laid and tended. I watched as young chicks poked and maneuvered their way out of their shell homes, now become prison. I watched as these newborns were tended and fed. I watched as they grew to look more like herons than fuzzy messes. Finally, the day came when I was privy to their flying lessons. It had never occurred to me that a bird wouldn't automatically know how to fly perfectly. What I watched was a comedy in errors. I watched the parents strategically fly off, but not too far, and leave the young ones seemingly unattended to figure out flying for themselves. I watched as the brave ones began to try their wings and hover ever so slightly above the nest. And then I watched them get braver and fly out of their nests and begin to play with the wind and landings. I watched as attempt after attempt was made to land back in the nest, only to be misjudged over and over again. Whoops! I didn't think I have ever laughed so hard in my life, nor been so touched by the beauty of this mastering of flying. Sometimes we forget that we had to learn how to walk, like these young birds had to learn how to fly. We forget how many times we fell. We forget that things take practice. Ray Charles was asked later on in his career if he still practiced and prepared for concerts. He replied that he played scales every day because when the scales were in his fingers, he could play anything. The question becomes for us, what are we practicing for? When is the last time you even asked yourself this question? Our granddaughter Tiana, at the very young age of three, knew she wanted to be on stage as a singer and dancer. She forsook all kinds of childhood pleasures to practice for hours, mimicking her favorite singer's words, gestures, and dance steps. And then she would delight us by performing a perfect routine. Tiana understood that to become something in the future takes effort in the now. In yoga, having a daily disciplined practice is referred to as sadhana, or spiritual discipline. And there are some other videos on my YouTube channel, um, which are guided yoga sadhana practices, and they include um, a guided meditation, um, guided breathing practices, and then a call and response chant or prayer as well. So in yoga, having a daily disciplined practice, spiritual practice is referred to as sadhana. And it's much like doing a small controlled burn on ourselves, burning away the impurities through this daily discipline of having a short meditation practice. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. For many people, it does um, can last an hour a day or so, but even just five to 10 minutes a day can really help. You'll really see the benefits, truly. It is the discipline of putting ourselves in places where the old debris that has collected in us can be removed. We engage in this process when we pay attention to the amount and kind of food we put in our body, when we move and exercise our bodies through walks, yoga, and other activities, when we expand our mental ability or study scripture with like-minded people. This process begins to remove unwanted pounds, lazy habits, an unexercised heart and body, a stale mind, and an unheard spirit. As Patabi Joyce reminds us, practice and all is coming. St. Francis of Assisi, in his well-known prayer, speaks eloquently to the possibilities of transformation for each human being. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. 
Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. This is a profound plea to change us from haters to lovers and from disturbers of peace to makers of peace. This is the prayer of tapas and it invites us to be in life in a different way. That brings us to the end of the first half of this chapter. So we'll cover the second half on tapas next week. I know this is one of the headier concepts, a little bit difficult to wrap the mind around if you're new, new to these ideas. Um, go back and watch the video on brahmacharya or non-excess. Um, that's one of the yamas, um, the actions to be restrained in order to attain inner peace. And it's all about this idea of moderation, um, the middle path, not doing too much, not eating a whole cake, but rather just enjoying one piece of the cake and really enjoying it, right? That can be tapas. Eating cake can be tapas. <laughs> eating one piece of cake versus eating the whole cake. That's the, that's the austerity, that's the discipline. Stopping after one slice of pizza or two slices of pizza, not eating a whole pizza, you know? So it doesn't have to be anything crazy. You don't have to walk miles barefoot. You don't have to um, climb mountains or fast for a week. No, it's the little um, small changes in the day-to-day, -day, the little disciplines in the day-to-day, -day, the small changes that add up that can really deeply and truly benefit us. I know it's, it's not one of the more fun topics, but um, it's something that corresponds to all everything else that we'll discuss in this series. And really it's very key, it's very important uh, for implementation in your daily lives so that this can help you in your, in your day to day. Okay, so we'll finish that chapter next week. And at the end of every chapter, she does give some questions for exploration. So I'll just share with you the first two reflection assignments and you can think about them between now and next week. Um, and then, yeah, I, I'd love to hear your reflections in the comments. Share with me how this is sitting for you. So remember the cathartic times in your life and how you were shaped by them. Catharsis, meaning release, the shedding, the burning away of the impurities or that which doesn't serve. Um, and it might be painful. It might have been pleasurable. Either way, getting rid of this purging. It could be a time when you were very sick, for example, purging these um, impurities. Uh, remember the cathartic times in your life and how you were shaped by them. Notice the times you may have checked out from the pain and others where you were fearless in the fire and held on for the blessing. So remembering perhaps that time when you were very sick or when you endured something that was painful and how did you respond to it? No judgment. No wrong or right here, just noticing how you responded to it. Did you check out from the pain or did you sit with it? Were you fearless in the fire? And then the next assignment this week, choose a practice of nourishing, eating, meditating, contemplating, or something else that impacts the quality of your essence. Can you put yourself in the heat with enthusiasm? So she just gives a few examples here and it does, you don't have to do all of these things. You don't have to do a lot. Um, just something simple, set an intention that you know is achievable for you that you can do every day between now and next week. Something small, meditating five minutes a day or limiting yourself to one cup of coffee for the day or one soda for the day, um, going to bed at a certain time every night, waking up at a certain time every morning, or just simply noticing something about yourself that maybe you've been wanting to shift a little bit, um, like noticing how often you cuss or noticing uh, when you lose your temper. Just keep track of that, keep note of it. Again, not judging, just simply noticing. When we bring this mindfulness, this awareness to whatever it is about ourselves that we'd like to improve, um, just bringing that light of awareness, shining the light of consciousness on it can really help so much. 
Uh, what doesn't help is judging ourselves and shaming ourselves and guilting ourselves, saying that's wrong. And, you know, I, I can't ever do better and that's just how I am. I'm a bad person. No, that's not true. You're a good person. You're trying your very best. I know you are. Just knowing that and giving yourself grace, going back to the first yama, ahimsa, nonviolence, giving yourself compassion, knowing that you do try your very best and just noticing where you could use some more austerity or discipline in your life. Mm -hmm. I'm just going back. She uses a, oh yeah, self-discipline. So thank you all for joining me this week. I hope that this content resonated for you. And if it did resonate, I would love it if you could like the video, share it, uh, tag some friends who you think might benefit from this information. Don't forget to subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're really interested in yoga philosophy and you'd like to go deeper with me, I talk a lot about this on my Patreon group. So for just $3.33 per month, you can join us. We talk not just about yoga philosophy, I also share about are you Ayurveda, uh, mindfulness practices and recipes, and just overall like healthy lifestyle tips for your mind, body, and spirit. So I'll link that as well in the description box for you guys. And otherwise, I hope that you have an amazing day and I will see you next time. Blessings.